Good afternoon. Welcome to The Future of Democracy, a show about the trends, ideas, and disruptions changing the face of our democracy. I'm your host, Sam Gill. On this show, what we try to do is take a critical issue of debate or discussion happening in our democracy and open it up, try to get into the factors um, that are driving that issue that may not be apparent or readily apparent in the surface level public debate. And one of the thorniest issues that we're dealing with right now is the role of social media in our democracy. From COVID to the election, we are in a debate of unprecedented intensity about how these platforms, which connect billions of people, should be managed. What content and voices should they allow? And who, if anyone, should they block? At the white hot center of this spotlight has been Twitter. In many ways, Twitter has adopted an aggressive stance. They have removed or corrected content from world leaders and pursued a hard line on authoritative health and election information. Recently, they even rolled out a read before you share feature to reduce the spread of potentially harmful or misleading content. Joining us today is one of the company's leads on this issue, Nick Pickles. Nick is the Senior Director for Public Policy Development at Twitter. Uh, so please welcome to the show, Nick Pickles. Hey Sam, how are you doing? Good, how are you? I think we're still you. missing your video. Apparently I can't share it because the host <laughs> disabled it, so. <laughs> oh no, that's uh, a taste of your own medicine, I guess. Um, we will uh, we'll work on that, but why don't we, uh, why don't we dive in um, while we get that, get that fixed? Um, there we go. There we go, you're back. Um, I see. <laughs> So, you know, the place I'd love to start is, is, is really in this moment, which is, it certainly seems to me that there has been a real acceleration in um, kind of the pace of policy change on Twitter in the COVID era and during this election, particularly around forms of misinformation. And so tell us a little bit about some of the changes that you've made, why you made them, and what effects you've seen. Um, well, thanks to be thanks for the invitation to join you, and um, I can't think of a more critical time to be discussing this topic. I think, you know, Jack Dorsey, our CEO, um, started talking about this concept of health, um, and rather than looking at individual metrics, uh, individual problems in isolation, try and take a much more holistic approach to how we tackle some of those issues. And then, faced with the COVID pandemic, uh, the, the literal and metaphorical priority to protect health. Uh, became something that really crystallized a lot of our work in this area. So as you referenced, we'd already taken you know, big decisions, things like banning political advertisements, disclosing uh, information operations archives we removed. But with COVID, we really had to uh, reimagine, I think, some of the boundaries uh, that had perhaps uh, sort of colored our thinking on these issues. And you do see us now taking uh, action to make sure that um, harmful uh, misinformation about the COVID uh, virus itself is spreading, providing extra context uh, to our users, which uh, is, I think, an increasingly critical part of how we make sure that uh, tech companies balance the need to help their users navigate this information system themselves, and at the same time, taking action to protect from that most harmful content. So really for us, it's been a culmination of several years' work combining people and technology. Uh, but I think you know, there are a wide range of challenges that still uh, still are out there. COVID is changing, the conversation is changing, the challenges are changing. And so for us, the, the big challenge for me, my colleagues, is that we can't stop thinking about what comes next and we have to keep thinking, how do we keep evolving to keep pace with everything that's happening around the world? Uh, is it working? Well, we're definitely making progress. I, I, I'm never gonna say that the, the job's done because um, for where we are today, where we're going to be in a month, in six months, you know, depends on a whole range of factors, some of which are outside of our control. But certainly I think, you know, taking a decision like banning political advertisements was not an easy one. Uh, it's not a simple one. We had to make sure that we protected the ability for people to run messages from 
you know, non-partisan official sources about voter registration, about telling people uh, where their polling place is, and balancing the ability to advocate for something like climate change. Um, so really striking those nuanced rules about, around cause-based advertising with careful regulation of who can place those advertisements, but then taking a much bigger step, not just as Twitter to recognize that this was content that we didn't want on our service, but to actually, I think, and this is something that uh, I, I'm really proud that companies work in this area, is to think bigger than just the day-to-day -day problem. And for us, micro-targeting, the way that AI, ML combined with ever decreasing segmentation um, is something that we felt was bigger than just our company. And so we, we made the decision in a societal framing, not just in a Twitter framing. And that's how we're looking at COVID, but we're making good progress. Bad actors keep changing their behavior, which is always something that we have to be aware of. Um, and I think as the, the weeks and days uh, proceed, both the US election, but also the, um, the uh, Brazilian elections, the Indian elections that are happening this year, uh, every election is different and we learn from them all. One of the things you mentioned was rethinking the boundaries and, and one of the boundaries that you all have been willing to cross that some of the other platforms haven't is you have taken down or corrected um, content by elected world leaders, including in the United States. And I'd love to hear more about how you came to that decision. Sure. Well, there's, there's several factors at play in a decision around this. The, the first thing, and this is something we, we said uh, two years ago, is that we recognize that Twitter is a place for geopolitics. Uh, in many ways, what used to happen in a smoke-filled room now happens with a mobile phone and tweets, which is an incredible responsibility uh, for us to protect that conversation. But we also have to recognize that there's a very special nuance towards communication between world leaders uh, the geopolitical saber rattling that we do see. And that's different from the conversation we see. So crafting uh, rules which protect against um, uh, our users um, taking action that may cause harm while protecting that transparent public geopolitical conversation. So I think we struck a balance where we felt that, uh, and this was informed in part by our users uh, and people on Twitter telling us, we don't want you to make decisions for us where the harm isn't pressing. We want you to give us more context, help us understand. And so that's why in some cases, you might see a warning message over a tweet that says, this tweet broke our rules. And um, we've applied that to world readers in a number of countries now. Um, and I think actually uh, uh, Brazil and Venezuela, um, we took action in those countries before we did in the United States. And giving people the context that this breaks our rules, but we know it's a matter of public debate and public record. So we want to preserve its availability but we'll limit the ability of, you can't retweet that tweet, you can't like that tweet. And then also in situations where the harm is lower, taking a situation and putting a find out more, um, learn, you know, for example, um, about COVID, about its transmission. Um, in some countries around the world, we saw uh, public figures talking about 5G, for example. So we had a dedicated information resource that we directed people to, to say, find out more about COVID and 5G, and then, curating the authoritative sources from you know, tweets from researchers, government agencies, experts in the field, and getting our users that context through those information buttons. What do you, it seems to me there's kind of a couple of views about this. So one would say, this is a kind of global public square, and so you need to balance the rights of different speakers. But I think there's another version of the critique that you face, right, which is, Twitter is like a new affordance. It's a new tool and the tool can be used by autocrats and the tool can be used by authoritative, legitimate sources of information um, and guidance. And it seems to me the argument that some people make that you should be more aggressive in responding to world leaders in particular is don't allow yourself to be the tool you know, of their autocracy, to be the tool of their misinformation. Don't become a megaphone, a weapon they didn't even have access to before. How do you respond to that critique? Well, I think that something we see every day around the world is that Twitter is one of the most powerful tools for people who are oppressed, for people who live in societies who in some cases don't even allow access to Twitter. Twitter is a tool for those people to challenge, to bring, you know, bring to attention some of the, at the beginning of the COVID crisis, video that was being smuggled out of China 
and being broadcast to the world through Twitter. So I think the, the, the nature of Twitter as a tool is something that is for politicians, but it's also for activists, for journalists, sure. for citizens. I think looking globally, the, the bigger challenge that I see is a lot of the policy conversations we have look at Twitter or social media as a silo and don't look at how the, the wider information ecosystem plays. And so you do see differences between, for example, uh, the role of state media, the role of corporate media that perhaps might have a franchise owner. Uh, you see the role of cultural institutions and the whole web of the information ecosystem um, has a very different, um, depending which lens you look at through, uh, has a very different problem. And so one of the things that, that we talk a lot about is we need to look at policy solutions that protect the whole media ecosystem. So we introduced a policy, we do not allow you to post hacked materials to Twitter. But what do we do when those hacked materials are on the front page of an international newspaper? And so I think that's where this, this tension arises between people looking to social media to solve problems that actually may exist far beyond um, our kind of control and our boundaries. I want to push on this a little bit, though, because I, I, um, it certainly seems to me to be at least partially an evolution in, in our whole thinking about social media. I mean, I, I had a chance a few weeks ago to talk to a former CEO of Twitter, Dick Costolo, and, um, and, and, and about a quote that I think is attributed to him, but actually belongs to um, your original counsel, which is, you know, Twitter is the, the sort of free speech wing of the, of the free speech party. And, if, you know, that, that sentiment was espoused, you know, at the same time that, you know, your predecessors at Twitter were getting calls from the State Department saying, if you take the service offline um, to do maintenance, you're, you will have a tangible impact on the Green Revolution happening in Iran. So there certainly was a real moment in which I think your point about the power of the tool to liberate people um, really validated this idea that we had this sort of new, this new space for expression and activism and ideas. It seems to me though, you know, the question we started with is COVID and the election are raising real questions about, you know, how, how in the real world, to what extent is the tool effective for that kind of positive discourse? And to what extent is the tool really enabling harmful content? I mean, has your, has your guys view changed about, about um, the kinds of, the re in real life, the risks versus the, the theoretical rewards? I mean, I think, I think that quote's been attributed to so many people at this point. <laughs> Fair enough. In the spirit uh, of free speech, everyone said. Um, um, anyone is free to claim it. It's uh, free of intellectual property rights for sure. No, I think, you know, certainly, uh, and I think, you know, looking back at the Arab Spring, I think one of the reflections that some people have shared is we focus too much on the technology and not enough on the people. Um, and actually the, the activists who are putting their lives in danger every day, um, they were doing that work and that, that the technology enabled that. The technology shared their message, but without those activists on the ground, the technology wouldn't have had the impact it had. And so I think, you know, I do think that um, sometimes it's, it's um, easy to give the credit or in some cases the blame to the technology company uh, rather than looking at the social conditions that exist. But I think your point is absolutely right. The, the way that we understand how public conversation happens now has evolved in part because um, the, the companies have matured, um, the research, um, you know, one of the things that, that Twitter from its beginning, um, the phrase was the tweets must flow. Well, one of the things about the tweets must flow is they've always fl flowed through an open API to researchers and to academics. And so we see studies around the world every day where people are looking at how is um, Twitter being used, whether it's in the context of religious and social issues, um, and actually particularly for COVID, we opened up a dedicated research endpoint with no cost attached for researchers wanting to specifically study tweets about COVID. So I think one of, one of the challenges is there's the public open internet, you know, Twitter being public and open by definition, and then there are uh, walled gardens that exist, whether because of the actions of a company, the actions of a government. Um, and so understanding what's happening between those two spaces is something I think that's becoming increasingly hard. But our view is that particularly with COVID, the risk of harm significantly increases when you have information telling you um, masks, for example, called health side effects or uh, that social distancing isn't required uh, when it's broadly recognized by the scientific community, both uh, are essential. And so us taking action there, whether it's to remove content, to provide context, is reflective also of the world we're now living in. Um, and so you know, that's why we focused our policy on three key areas, COVID, 
civic integrity to protect um, elections, and also synthetic and manipulated media. Um, and those three policy areas having the greatest potential for harm are where we focused our efforts. But I think the, the, the shift that has happened in thinking is also that the world isn't just about do you take content down or do you leave content up? I think for me, that's one of the biggest shifts that's happened in the past year or so is now there are a range of interventions. Uh, the work we've done on QAnon, for example, to de-amplify, we, we allow people to speak, but we're not going to allow the amplification through the product versus in some situations adding a label to add context while always maintaining that for, for issues like promotion of terrorism, we take a zero tolerance approach and are removing that content. That I think is the biggest shift is that the, the world of 10 years ago is, was just leave up, take down. And now we have this range of interventions, each of which appropriate to different harms, different risks. But I guess, so I guess, the, so this to me, if one feels like a very profound shift, I mean, it feels like a shift from in, in less than five years from a, a worldview that seemed to suggest that innovation and openness will always be at least net beneficial. That sort of in the language of tech, the affordances will somehow outweigh the vulnerabilities to a view that says there's real harm and we have to be actively engaged in harm prevention and harm reduction, um, even if that has some innovation cost. But I guess the question would be, is that enough, right? I mean, even, even this, you know, the story of this week is that, um, is that, sort of thanks to the affordances of, of th thanks to what technology can do, uh, Trump's sort of characterize it however you want, the way Trump responded to the question about re repudiating white supremacists, it sort of seeded a viral campaign um, among the Proud Boys, among this white supremacist group, the Proud Boys, um, that they were actually able to promote themselves. And and I, I, you know, I take your point that that's, that's a mainstream media moment that gives birth to that. That's, a, that's an elected official on live national broadcast television, but it certainly the, the ensuing campaign took advantage of what technology allows people to do. Can you get ahead of the way that these actors, whether it's a foreign government, an extremist group, or someone just interested in creating fog around health information, their ability to move and adapt um, even as you make policy. I, I think this is, this is exactly, as you say, that the big shift that's happened, and you know, perhaps even since Dick was CEO of Twitter, is the shift from being reactive to proactive. So if you take something like state media, um, two years ago, uh, or three years ago now, um, we just took the decision for Russia, and Sp Russia Today and Sputnik to remove them from the ability to advertise, uh, which we've now broadened to any state-controlled media. That's a reactive change. It stops them advertising. We're also proactively now applying labels. So if you see a tweet from Russia Today and Sputnik from Chinese state controlled media, you actually in your timeline in real time are notified this is coming from a government source. We've also taken that action for government accounts because one of the things that we, we recognized and particularly looking at protests around the world, the interplay between state controlled media and government is incredibly important. So by being proactive and applying those labels, we give people more context. And I think that's the big shift that has happened. Uh, last year, about half of the content that Twitter took down uh, was taken down, surfaced by our technology, reviewed by people and removed, rather than waiting for a user report. So that to me is the big, big shift is, rather than being reactive, waiting for the problem and then trying to deal with it on a case by case basis, it's how do you take much more systematic approaches, ideally leveraging technology, so that you can get ahead of these problems. But I think the, the challenge is, is that bad actors will always evolve. So there's always an element of reactivity and how do you, how do you build resilience? And so one of the things that, that we decided to do, not to empower Twitter, but to empower the research community, to empower governments, the public, was every time we now take down an information operation that we attribute to a foreign state, that content isn't available for anybody. Um, and so what we are now doing is making that archive available to researchers not so they can just look at how many tweets were sent on a certain day, but look at the narratives, look at the tactics, which through then having wider social discussion of, as you may have seen yesterday, we took down some Iranian accounts, uh, thanks uh, in partnership with the FBI, educating people about the tactics of adversaries, about the narratives they're using, is part of building resilience and empowering the public to be better protected. So yeah, I think, we, I think industry is far more proactive than it has been, and for us, that use of technology and people going forward is gonna be critical to how we protect the public conversation. So one of the questions, speaking of proactive, we're getting from the audience is, 
what are you what are you starting to plan for the aftermath of the U.S. election, where there's obviously a lot of anxiety about content calling the election, content that there was you know some some election administration um, problem that should cast the cast the results into doubt. Are you already thinking about how you'll respond to that? Yeah, and, and I think it's my point. Actually, I was just just looking at my mug. Um, I have a very branded Twitter mug, but it's um, from the UK general election 2015. Um, and the number of elections that have happened around the world, um, we, we know every year is an election year on Twitter. So we learned from our the previous experiences. So in some uh, cases, take the Indian election. Actually, the polling process takes place over, over several weeks. So you're thinking, how do you protect against those kind of uh, cascading effects of results from previous regions? So the, our, our approach on this is, is, again, a combination of taking down content where there's the highest risk of harm. So at a simple level there, telling someone to vote on the wrong day. And we're gonna remove that under our civic integrity policy. We're then gonna take a look at content that perhaps might be confusing uh, and risk be misleading, where there's no call to action and there's no specific um, uh, issue there. That's where we can provide extra context. So that might be uh, linking people through, uh, through a label to information that's coming from credible authorities at the state level. Uh, so it might be that um, if, you, if you're in a certain state, how do you find out what's happening? Well, often those state election boards, those state attorneys general are tweeting uh, in real time um, the latest information. So we want to make sure people can find that information quickly. Um, we've already banned political adverts. And I think you know, what you're now seeing actually is a recognition that political ads aren't just about campaigning. They're about setting a narrative um, and, and spreading a message far beyond uh, organic reach. And so by limiting that advertising already, I think we've closed down the risk there. And then we're going to make sure that, um, you know, the, the news organizations that we partner with, that their credible information is prominent for all of our users. So that when people do start to make statements, um, if it's within our rules, we can provide context. But if people do start to make statements, and uh, I'd urge everyone who, who's watching to go and read our civic integrity policy, we have, we have updated it specifically to cover questions of, um, undermining confidence in the election and also um, claiming um, victory early. Politics is always going to be fluid, so we've got to have flexibility in our policies. Um, but this is something that I think we and, and, and with our partners in government and in civil society are looking very carefully at how we make sure we get the best information and the most accurate information to the most number of people quickly. One question that often comes up around, um, around policy is uh, for, for platforms of the scale of Twitter is, is the enforcement question. You know, can the computational tools or human moderation, whatever, or hybrid actually keep up with the level of content that might be violating the policy? How do you assess the ability for Twitter to, especially given the frenzy of content uh, around some of these issues to actually be able to enforce at a level that you think is gonna have beneficial effect? The, and this is something that we, we're, we're thinking about carefully as well. So. The way that Twitter works, obviously there are accounts who have prominent followings, there are small and new accounts. And we said when we updated our policy uh, that we would be focusing on the most harmful content with the widest audience. And so that's our focus is on. Um, and again, this I think is, is a recognition that, that the, certainly when we talk to regulators globally, uh, that all pieces of content are not the same. And so if you try and have a standard approach where every piece of content must be reviewed in the same period of time, what that risks is, is that you're no, not focusing your resources on the areas of highest impact. And so we're focusing on whether it's you know, the, the, uh, the verified accounts that you will see on Twitter, whether it's those accounts with the highest engagement, but also working with partners. Uh, and so again, this is something, whether it's our partners in government, uh, our partners within political parties, uh, and our partners in civil society, uh, trusting their expertise to say, this might be something that's building momentum a really pressing problem for us uh, is the idea that people are organizing on other platforms. And so actually working with partners who are saying, hey, you might have seen this conversation happening. They're thinking of coming onto Twitter. Be aware. Those kind of conversations where we can be proactive and prepare uh, to things that are being organized off Twitter is also a big part of how we make sure we stay ahead of this challenge. What... Um... So one thing I want to be sure to ask you about before before we wrap is uh, an announcement you made in the last couple of weeks, um, basically nudging people to actually read something before they share it, which I thought was sort of an interesting admission of something I think we all suspected, which is that the ease of sharing, which is obviously one of the great fantastic elements of social media that, that those of us who use it take advantage of, can be an incentive um, to pass along content that an individual 
uh, may not have fully digested. And, and obviously, you know, by definition, um, leads to the proliferation of that content. Um, what, tell us a little bit about how, how, this, uh, how this came about and how it's going. Well, I, I think the, the simplicity of the, uh, the intervention, I think is, it speaks to the benefits of taking an approach that isn't just content moderation led. So in the case of digital literacy, which is something that is a societal uh, need, it's gonna come from schools, it's gonna come from parents, it's gonna come from nonprofits and civil society. Um, but there are things that we can do, and this isn't a company expressing a view on the content, it's not a company um, trying to tell you to, to take one view or the other, it's just making sure that people are in, and David Rand at MIT has done some great work about looking at how do you trigger a mindset of critical thinking. And I think this is this intervention, and so that the data we saw was that by prompting people to say, you, you, you haven't read this, are you sure you want to share it? Um, we actually saw a 40% reduction in the number of people who were retweeting that content without having read it. So I think that's a really simple example. Um, we have a great long-standing partnership with UNESCO um, to spread digital, digital, digital literacy skills. And I think this, is, this intervention is a really good example of how often with content moderation, you're focused on making a judgment of the content. And actually, this is something where you can use behavioral signals to say, actually, just by nudging somebody to say, would you like to read this? we can improve critical thinking, improve digital literacy, and then hopefully improve the wider quality of information that's being shared across Twitter. You know, one of the sort of generalized arguments about social media, particularly social media that includes, uh, that, that, that makes, uh, that earns revenue out of advertising is that the phenomenon that you identified and are intervening is exactly the thing that's trying to be generated, right? That what we, what the systems are designed, I'm not saying Twitter specifically, but, but sort of a general argument about social media is that the systems are designed to, um, to get you not to read, right? To get you to just engage with as much content as possible, share it with as many people as possible. That's the network effect that makes the, the, the platform valuable. So to what extent is this, is this um, against interest, do you think? To what extent is this, gonna, is, is this kind of intervention going to run aground on the, just the, the, the economic physics of the way that a lot of social media, media works? Well, I think this is a really good example of um, when Jack Dorsey, our CEO, testified to Congress. Um, he spoke about this is something about rethinking the fundamental incentives of services like Twitter. And so I think this is a good example of how, you know, people may uh, focus on the business model that we have, but actually in an intervention like this, taking decisions to understand why do people on Twitter behave the way they do, can we help improve the quality of the information on Twitter? Um, this is a good example of how actually rethinking those incentives is something that we can make meaningful progress on and improve Twitter. And I think then, uh, and this goes to the, the question of how we improve the health of Twitter, is our view that improving health, improving critical thinking, is a, is a supporter of our business model, um, and that the, the, the healthier Twitter is. Uh, that's healthy for our, the people on Twitter, it's healthy for the conversation, and it's healthy for our business. So I think actually what you're seeing is you can, um, the, 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 sort of the cynical assessment may be those two things are in tension, but actually from a point of view of looking at the health of Twitter, we think they're actually very complimentary. So last question, you've used the word health a lot, and, and I know it, it refers in part to, um, to a specific way that you've defined what a healthy Twitter is, but let me ask you a bigger question, which is, in what, what is, what is the healthy relationship between social media and democracy? If social media is making democracy healthier, what's it, what's it doing for democracy? Well, I think there would be the whole, whole other conversation. I'm not sure how much time we've got left, but I think for me as someone who, you know, I live in a different country from my family uh, and where I grew up and um, I'm someone who's deeply passionate about um, issues of, of politics and, and how society and technology interact. The transparency that a platform like Twitter brings, where things that used to be go written in diaries, things that used to be shared in small circles of advisors and only years later uh, brought to life, we now have real-time open public conversation between elected officials across state lines, across national lines, across continental and political divides. Um, that's something that I think is still transformative. And so um, progress is never linear and there's always going to be challenges. And we have to be deeply and acutely aware of the responsibility we have to make sure that conversation is healthy. 
But I think that the, the net benefit that we, we spoke about earlier, the, the value of being able to speak as an individual to people directly in public office and actually hear back from them, have conversations. You know, certainly there was some, some great research that the Knight Foundation actually published looking at people who used um, platforms like Twitter saw a broader range of information sources than people who were not digitally connected. So I think you're seeing people accessing more information, having more conversations with people from different backgrounds and different um, cultures. That to me is, a, a, is still an absolute underpinning benefit of democracy. And I think one of the challenges um, as we evolve through elections around the world is the, the role of social media in providing quality information and context to people on those platforms, but also the, the responsibility of both policymakers the candidates in elections and the wider media eco ecosystem, each playing their part. And I think that's where we're now seeing um, an aw awareness of, you know, the Washington Post recently publishing principles that would underpin how it would cover um, certain challenging issues during the election. And so I think, you know, we're, we're, we're incredibly invested in making sure that the health of Twitter improves. Uh, we think that is a, a supporter to democracy and actually as a company, advocating for the open internet, which we believe drives societal and democratic value, is something that is far bigger than just Twitter, but also speaks to the fact that we believe the open internet does go hand in hand with democracy. And those places uh, where the open internet isn't available, well, we think actually that by advocating for the open internet and protecting the open internet, we're also advocating for and protecting democracy. Well, if you want to get deeper in these topics, you can follow Nick on Twitter at Nick Pickles. You can also follow Twitter's public policy team at Policy to learn more about some of these developments and decisions as they precipitate. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks very much, Sam. All right, folks, we've got some incredible shows coming up in the, uh, in the weeks to follow. Uh, on October 8th, for a very different view than I think you heard today, we'll hear from Rashad Robinson from Color of Change, who was a lead architect of the Facebook uh, ad moratorium um, by a number of advertisers this summer, the Stop Hate for Profit campaign. On October 15th, we'll hear from Stephen Hawkins, Director of Research at More in Common, which has been putting out field-leading research on polarization and division in United States politics. And on October 22nd, we'll hear from Zeta Tukfeci, an associate professor at the University of North Carolina, and who has emerged as a kind of contemporary Nostradamus uh, about topics ranging from social media and its role in our democracy, what we talked about today, to the uh, COVID crisis and how we should be responding. As a reminder, this episode will be up on the website later today. You can see this episode and any episode on demand at kf.org slash fdshow. You can also subscribe to the Future of Democracy podcast on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you go for podcasts. Email us at fdshow at kf.org. Or if you have questions for me, just send me a note on Twitter at the Sam Gill. Please stay for a few seconds after the show to take a two question survey. And as always, we will end the show to the sounds of Miami singer-songwriter Nick County. You can check out his music and follow him on Spotify. Until next week, thank you for joining us and stay safe.